Registered Phenomena Code 137 Object Class Alpha White Hazard Types Visual Hazard Transmutation Hazard Containment Protocols RPC-137 is to be kept in a climate-controlled secure storage locker at Site-38. Access for testing requires a minimum clearance level 2, with additional authorization from clearance level 3 research staff. Personnel accessing RPC-137 are to submit written accounts of all fiction produced during their session of use. RPC-137 is a white, unlabeled, hardcover book. When opened by an observer, the previously blank pages will fill with a short piece of fiction centered with the observer as the protagonist. Narratives are universally grounded in reality, and often simply portray the observer engaging in mundane activities shortly after opening RPC-137. The contents of RPC-137 are only visible to the immediate observer, and stories are unable to be recorded using photography or video vanishing to the observer upon closing the cover. Narratives will grow in length and complexity if an individual observer returns multiple times over an extended period of time, with the narration often taking a fonder tone and describing the observer with more positive adjectives. Events depicted in RPC-137 narratives do not appear to be prescient in any way, although the actions of the protagonist will rarely be out of character for the observer and descriptions of locations are always accurate to the time of reading. For posterity, all uses of RPC-137 are to be logged in the following document. Date 2000 Observer Agent Format Single paragraph in the third person Narrative Agent Closes RPC-137, smiles and leaves the room. Note, Generated during initial acquisition of RPC-137 after a raid on a gear warehouse, during which a number of other minor anomalous artifacts were acquired. I wouldn't consider it that reliable of a testimony given the circumstances, though. Date: February 13, 2000 Observer Researcher Jones Format Single paragraph in the third person Narrative Jones stares around the testing chamber, leaving with a frown after determining it to be empty beyond RPC-137. Notes: First use of RPC-137 in standard testing conditions. There was little variance from the initial use beyond the emotional state of the protagonist. Date: February 13, 2000. Observer: Researcher Jones. Format: Single paragraph in the third person. Narrative. Jones closes RPC-137 and leaves the testing chamber. Notes, this test was done immediately after the previous one, and the narrative is identical beyond the removal of a sentence describing me observing the testing chamber. Maybe there's a cooldown period. Date, February 14, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, two paragraphs in the third person. Narrative. Jones closes RPC-137 and goes to leave the testing chamber, but turns back before reaching the door. Jones collects RPC-137 and returns to his office. Notes, the description given for the hallway outside the testing chamber and my office are startlingly accurate. I'm beginning to think this thing might be getting inside my head, which makes me uncomfortable, but what harm can it really do if no one else can see what it's writing? Date, February 14, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, four paragraphs in the third person Narrative, Jones collects RPC-137 and carries it around on his daily routine. RPC-137 is returned to the testing chamber after Jones returns from lunch. Notes, again, the locations were accurate, but none of the people it mentions are real. None of the incidental events it mentioned even came close to happening, as much as I'd like some of my colleagues to be that chatty. Still, I don't think it's safe for me to be messing with it if it's taking things from my mind. I'm putting in an application to get a CSD for this. Date: March 1, 2000 Observer CSD-44351 Format: One paragraph in the third person Narrative 
CSD-44351 closes RPC-137 and looks around the testing chamber quizzically, frowning when it becomes apparent she is alone. Notes, this is the first time the narrative has ended without someone entering or exiting the room. Was the book expecting me to be there? Date, March 2, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format, two paragraphs in the third person. Narrative: CSD-44351 collects RPC-137 and returns to her holding cell, with CSD-44351 beginning to frown during the journey. Notes, CSD-44351 security escort suddenly begins to be described as present halfway to the cell, despite not being mentioned prior. CSD-44351 begins frowning at the time this occurs. Date, March 3, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format, five paragraphs in the third person Narrative, CSD-44351 collects RPC-137 and is escorted to the cafeteria by our armed escort. CSD-44351 is served a standard meal and engages in minor conversation with our escort while eating. CSD-44351 returns RPC-137 to the testing chamber and leaves, smiling. Notes, none of the personal details mentioned by the security staff are accurate, but the third-person narrator uses some unusually positive language to refer to CSD-44351's facial features. CSD-44351 appears to have appreciated it, referring to the story as nice and expressing her wish to return again. Date, March 5, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format, seven paragraphs in the third person Narrative, CSD-44351 is accompanied by her armed escort, and has served a meal of paya to her audible delight. CSD-44351 returns to her holding cell with RPC-137. Notes, the meal served is not one standard to the site's cafeteria, but it's described in significant detail. CSD-44351 claims the meal's description was exactly how it used to taste back home. CSD-44351's assigned security staff stop being described once she reaches the cafeteria and are not mentioned again until she is escorted back to her holding cell. Date, March 6, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format, two pages in second person Narrative, CSD-44351 enters the testing chamber with a gloomy disposition and collects RPC-137. CSD-44351 slumps against the wall of the testing chamber and initiates a one-sided conversation with RPC-137 about their current mental state and long-running feelings of isolation. CSD-44351, suddenly appearing to have a new resolve, outlines the reasons she believes there is still worth in her existence. CSD-44351 embraces RPC-137 before leaving the room. Notes, this is the first time second-person narration has been observed, which frames this as a pep talk of sorts. CSD-44351 appeared grateful for the opportunity to interact with RPC-137 and described the narrative as cathartic. Date, March 8, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format a single-sided chat log from the perspective of CSD-44351. Narrative: CSD-44351 appears to be having a conversation with a second party, however their responses are not recorded. CSD-44351 asks a number of personal questions to the second party, and responds positively to their answers. The conversation ends with CSD-44351 claiming that she needed to return to her cell, but would enjoy speaking again. Notes, another new shift in format. It should be noted that CSD-44351 continued reading until her allotted time of exposure to RPC-137 was up, almost as though the text length emulated real-time conversation. When pressed, CSD-44351 claimed that the questions her fictional counterpart asked seemed like something she would say, 
but could not confirm whether she understood the messages the unseen other party were sending because of that. Due to concern over this development, CSD-44351's allotted exposure time has been decreased. Date, March 9, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format, two paragraphs in the third person. Narrative, CSD-44351 opens RPC-137 and stares at the empty pages intently, before closing it. Notes. CSD-44351 was reading for much longer than should be expected given the narrative recounted. Date, March 12, 2000 Observer, CSD-44351 Format, a single haiku Narrative, CSD-44351 is described affectionately as an object of fondness separated from the author by distance and circumstance. Notes, this move towards direct interaction with CSD-44351 is definitely fascinating, as her appearing to return the sentiment, but I'm uncomfortable with the implications at play. At this advanced level of interaction, I'm cutting it off before we breach protocol. Date, March 15, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, two paragraphs in the third person Narrative, Jones immediately leaves the testing chamber without interacting with RPC-137, returning to his office. Once seated, Jones stares at a photograph of his family. Notes, I'm sure RPC-137 is sapient now. There's no wish fulfillment here. Date, March 16, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, one paragraph in the third person. Narrative, Jones begins in his office, staring at a photograph of his family. Is it trying to guilt trip me? Date, March 17, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, one paragraph in the second person Narrative, Jones begins in his office, staring at a photograph of his family Note, this is just the same narrative as last time, with a more hostile narrator Date, March 18, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, one paragraph in the third person Narrative. Jones begins in his office, staring at a photograph of CSD-44351. Notes. We're not getting anywhere. Date. March 19, 2000 Observer. Researcher Jones. Format. Ten paragraphs in the third person. Narrative. Jones leaves the testing chamber and exits Site-38, observing proper protocol at each checkpoint. Notes. Is it trying to tell me to go away? Date. March 20, 2000 Observer, Researcher Jones Format, 13 paragraphs in the third person Narrative, Jones leaves the testing chamber and makes a detour to CSD-44351's holding cell before exiting Site-38. Notes, the narratives are changing, but the sentiment remains the same. I think we just about reached the end of our need for testing. Date, March 20, 2000 Observer unknown. Format unknown. Narrative unknown. Notes. Security footage showed RPC-137 briefly opening on its own not long after I left the chamber to return to my office. No one was present in the room. I don't understand what it could have been reacting to. Date. March 21, 2000 Observer Researcher Jones Format. 20 paragraphs in the first person. Narrative. An unknown second party follows Jones as he leaves Site-38, exploiting several holes in Site-38 security protocols to do so. Upon leaving the parking lot of Site-38, the entity speaks for the first time and claims, Suckers. Notes, is it threatening me? I'm passing these exploits onto the security staff anyway, just in case they're accurate. Was RPC-137 always missing a page? Incident 137-01 on March 21, 2000, CSD-44351 escaped Authority custody using knowledge presumed to have come from RPC-137. CSD-44351 exhibited significant knowledge on the layout of Site-38 and its security protocols, and security footage captured CSD-44351 staring at a blank page, presumed to have come from RPC-137, several times during the escape attempt. CSD-44351 currently remains at large. Addendum 
following Incident 137-01, RPC-137 no longer responds to observers and will instead periodically open on its own. If observed in this state, the narrative will invariably involve the protagonist acting as the narrator, describing a mundane event in the life of two women engaged in a romantic relationship.